Hi everybody, it's my great honor and pleasure to be part of this conference with you here today. I have created a film to share with you. It's about 20 minutes long and it's on the topic of the future of artificial intelligence and meditation and I hope you enjoy it. With the advent of artificial intelligence, deep learning, and virtual reality avatars, consistent personal tutelage, directly correlated to one's individual needs and difficulties, becomes both possible and feasible. Although at first this might seem disconcerting or undesirable, the fact is that communicative technologies have always been widely adopted over the past centuries by religious leaders. And these range from book distribution, utilizing postal services, to voice modifiers, loudspeakers, and microphones, to visual magnifiers, video projections, and webinars. The next logical step in this direction is 3D immersion via virtual, augmented, and mixed reality, which offers full-bodied representations. What makes this latest conveyance fundamentally different, though, is that it can be coupled with synthetic neural networks, machine learning, and lifelike simulations. In this presentation, we want to explore how meditative practices and spiritual communities will be transformed by these futuristic innovations. So much so, in fact, that we will be witnessing a digital revolution, the likes of which were previously unimaginable. Our central thesis is that the evolution of communicative systems brings with them new and innovative ways to educate and to learn. Because of this, the very way Radha Swami teachings are transmitted in the next few decades will be greatly expanded and enhanced. The evolution of communication. The history of how we communicate is intimately correlated to the mediums we use to share our ideas. However, each channel we employ to convey our ideas transforms how we interact. Marshall McLuhan, the famed media critic of the 1960s, had it precisely right when he opined, the medium is the message. His insight was not altogether new, as centuries ago Socrates echoed a similar sentiment. It is little wonder, therefore, why Johannes Gutenberg's invention of the printing press has long been considered essential for the birth of modern civilization, since it allows for information to be generated and communicated in record time. Furthermore, the use of an electrical medium, such as telegraphy, forever changed how knowledge could be shared, with the advent of radio, television, tape recording, microphones, loudspeakers, and more. The human ability to magnify ideas and opinions open avenues never witnessed before. Thus, by the 1930s and the 1940s, with the introduction of electronic computers, passing on information had potential to become free from its spatial and temporal constraints to fly unencumbered at nearly the speed of light. With the invention of the internet and later Tim Berners-Lee's development of the World Wide Web via hypertext markup language, the digitalization of human knowledge became ubiquitous. I bring all of this up as a necessary preface since we can look back at the history of how meditational practices were taught and later transmitted to see that it has followed the evolution of communicative inventions. Spiritual teachings, no matter how esoteric, follow where technology leads. The Evolution of Radha Swami Communication Although the founder of Radha Swami Singh, 1818 to 1878, gathered several disciples in the 1850s, he did not publicly commence open satsang until Basant Bashami Day in the mid part of February in 1861. It is a bit unclear how Swamiji's new satsang was announced, though it appears that some sort of printed material was posted in Agra and shared. Books. Six years after Shiv Dal Singh's death on August 25, 1878, Raisaligram and Partap Singh sponsored and published a large book which contains the teachings and bani of Swamiji Maharaj. Sarbachan, which has been divided into two key sections, prose and poetry, contains the essence of Radha Swami cosmology, practices, and precepts. This book, which has gone through multiple editions and translations in various languages, has had an outsized influence on the practice of Shabad Yoga in many different branches of Radha Swami and other disassociated spiritual movements, including Ekankar. Its founder, Paul Twitchell, referred to the English version as his Bible. Postal Correspondence 
Given Rai Saligram's high status as postmaster general, centered in Allahabad, it is perhaps not accidental that mail correspondence became a key factor in communicating the esoteric teachings of Shabad Yoga. Starting with Swamiji Maharaj, the first Radhaswami master to express his teachings via a series of letters, utilizing the postal service has been elemental amongst almost all Radhaswami gurus in reaching satsangs and interested seekers throughout India and later abroad. The Satsang of the Future Perhaps one of the most instructive ways to understand the future is to look back several decades and see how much has changed in just 30 years. In 1990, there were no smartphones, no widely used internet access terminals for the general public, no websites, no Google, no cloud computing, and the list goes on. Let us look at the evolution of satsang over the past 100 years and see how much has changed due to technological innovations. This will give us a baseline in which to project out several decades hence on how it may be conducted in the future. 1. Satsang was conducted by the guru with a small group of disciples in an enclosed space or occasionally under a tree in a nearby garden. It was a purely vocal affair, with a Shabad Yoga master discoursing from a particular passage or poem. 2. When disciples were not able to attend the guru's gathering, they would develop their own satsangs, usually reading from some holy scripture and elaborating upon its intended meaning and how it may help in sadhana. 3. Under British rule, the postal system became more reliable, and correspondence between the guru and or his chosen representative and his disciples became relatively commonplace. 4. Traveling to distant areas became easier with the development of railroads, and decades onwards with automobiles and airplanes. This allowed the guru to visit outlying centers and towns that before took days and weeks. 5. Later, when loudspeakers became available in the 1920s and 1930s, the guru could speak and be heard by much larger audiences. This technological innovation, though it encouraged much bigger gatherings, also meant that many in the audience would not be able to be in close proximity to the guru. Thus, many had to rely more on hearing the message and less on a close line of sight of the guru. 6. With the advent of films, television, and video cameras, it provided a new way for satsangis and seekers to see and hear the guru. Today, it's not uncommon for satsangis to view their spiritual leader on closed circuit televisions or even watch him respond to questions and answers on a specialized YouTube channel. In a sense, the guru and his message are now everywhere, at least electronically speaking. All of this leads us to what comes next. Presence. The fundamental aspect of the guru-disciple relationship is one predicated upon the feeling of presence. This is why satsangis and seekers will travel far distances to have the darshan of their master. There's a special feeling one gets whenever one comes into close personal contact with an esteemed personage. While 2D interaction, such as Zoom or FaceTime or video conferencing, do help one connect over long distances, allowing for real-time visual and audio communication, it lacks intimacy. This is where virtual reality technology comes in and why it can and will usher in a radically new form of communication. The one key feature of VR is that it provides an overwhelming sense of being there with another person, even if each are using self-created avatar representations. As Matt Sparks explains, as VR technology advances in the near future, we may no longer be able to tell the difference between reality and VR. With the advent of ever-improving VR headsets, it is quite conceivable, perhaps inevitable, that certain Radhaswami branches will adopt virtual reality as one of the primary means of conducting satsangs and connecting with satsangis. Why? Because VR provides an entirely innovative way of providing students the most intimate setting possible to experience the presence of the respective guru, with the uncanny feeling that he or she is right there with them. It is precisely because of this that VR ushers in a much more satisfactory form of communication. Virtual reality, coupled with artificial intelligence, also offers pathways never thought possible before. The spiritual teacher can produce hundreds, nay thousands of avatars that perfectly represent him and his ideals without any intermediaries. Such avatars could then offer personal instruction to the neophyte based on a consistent and explanatory interactive questions and answers. 
the entire database of Radhaswami literature can be accessed and utilized point by point to specifically address any spiritual issues one may have. That information, in turn, can be embodied via a specific avatar that can respond personally to one individual at a time. This allows for tutelage on a grand scale that is simply not possible when there are thousands of devotees scattered across the globe. Bypassing the language barrier. With systems such as Google Translate getting better day by day, it is not a stretch to imagine that spiritual talks will be available in almost any language in real time without having to resort to human intervention. This way, if the guru is speaking Hindi, it can be simultaneously translated into English, Spanish, Mandarin Chinese, Gujarati, and a host of other languages. What augmented reality and virtual reality provide when interlaced with deep machine learning is a new way of presenting information that is individualized and more applicable to the needs of the student. One can access almost all spiritual literature via the net and have it tailored to the exact question or issue one asks within nanoseconds and all of this by voice command or hand gestures or by eye tracking. AI Guided Meditation Applications I realize that using sophisticated hardware to augment solo meditational sittings may seem at first glance to rely too heavily on technology, but the fact remains that meditational aids have been used since the very beginning of yogic practices, even if they were crude in comparison to what is available now. The Dialbog Educational Institute in Agra has been at the forefront of studying Shabha Yoga from a scientific perspective. They have even constructed a small chamber in which to measure the brain waves of advanced meditators with the hopes of better understanding the connection between deep concentration and neural electrical discharges. This is a much more important advance than most people realize since it affords outside observers not privy to the interior states of contemplatives a glimpse of what is possible when one's attention is fine-tuned to the sound current. In addition, a controlled experiment was conducted at Dialbog which solicited reports from various followers concerning their subjective inner experiences, as Prem Prashant reported in his abstract of the study. The experiences were broadly classified into four categories, worldly experiences, meditational experiences, out-of-body experiences, and general guidance and protection. This preliminary study lays the groundwork for more extensive scientific studies to be presented before international audiences. On another forefront, already a number of brain scanning devices for meditation have been released for the general consumer, including the popular and easy to wear and monitor Muse. It is very simple to use and it connects seamlessly with one's smartphone and records your brain waves in three distinct modes, active, neutral, and calm. After five minute session, for instance, which begins with a brief calibration and short introduction, it will produce a brain activity chart replete with how many minutes were spent calmly neutrally or actively. The fun part about the device is that it entices you to become as still as possible. Since then, a tiny bird sound emerges. Racking up more bird sounds is indicative of how deep you have gone into your meditation. I see great potential for these accessories since they allow for real-time analytics and can serve as progressive markers with which meditators can better gauge more precisely what is transpiring during their meditation sittings. The integration of Muse, or similar such devices, and its more advanced iterations within virtual reality will be a game changer in the future since it will allow meditators to be fully immersed into an environment that can potentially capture each of their senses, from seeing to hearing to even touching. Back in the 1950s, John Lilly pioneered building deprivation tanks to see how the mind responds when lacking incoming stimuli. He augmented his water immersed sessions with certain psychotropic drugs, and the results were startling. He experientially realized the mind, when deprived of sights and sounds and smells, would by itself virtually create a kaleidoscope of wondrous simulations. Yogis in the past would often put themselves in isolated environments so as to better focus within during their deep meditations, and began to produce a sophisticated phenomenology of what they encountered. AI-connected concentration devices will be able to accelerate the learning curve of would-be meditators who don't live in a remote cave or forest and don't ingest psychedelic drugs. 
Already there are a number of VR applications which help novices in practicing pranayama by providing visual cues of light and sound. The TRIP app, in particular, has an ingenious method of monitoring how one inhales and exhales in a precise timed sequence. These applications also provide ever-changing landscapes to better focus the wandering mind. Moreover, AI will in the future optimize which strategies are most conducive for richer meditational experiences. The Digital Guru The future of meditation can be based more on a scientific understanding and less on an outdated mythological one. The Tibetan Cave of Tomorrow can be constructed instantaneously with a VR or an AR, and each of us can have our own spiritual teachers guiding us, even if they're wearing purely technological garb. While it would be a fundamental error to confuse such an astral projection with a digital reconstructed avatar, the fact remains that AI and VRAR can reproduce one's own beloved Ishtar Deva in such a way as to make one feel as if their teacher is right there with them. These can be likened to the most realistic murties ever fashioned, but with such lifelike animations and responsive databases that they can transcend any material representation. To be sure, these digitized manifestations are not yet substitutes for living human teachers, but they are remarkable tools for spiritual instruction. The Virtual Ashram In light of VR and AR technologies, it becomes exceedingly obvious that the future of spiritual centers and deras are not built of brick and mortar, but of informational bits. The ashram of the future is virtual. Why? because with virtual reality is now possible to create almost any type of environment that is all encompassing, personally scalable, and can serve as a retreat from the hustle and bustle of daily life. What makes the virtual ashram so inviting is that its costs are nearly free, can be shared with almost anyone around the world, and most importantly, is amenable to changes almost instantaneously. The spiritual center of the future is available to anyone, anytime, anywhere. There are no boundaries in this digitally enhanced satsangar. Mixing Realities Although VR and AR are the two cornerstones of the metaverse, mixed reality, MR, will most likely be the relative mainstay on how we live in the future. What mixed reality does is utilize virtual and augmented reality and overlay the rich informational ecosystems on the world we presently inhabit providing us with what the eminent philosopher David Chalmer calls Reality Plus. As he explains in his recent text of the same name, Reality Plus is my name for the universe of virtual and non-virtual worlds. You can think of Reality Plus as physical reality combined with the metaverse of augmented and virtual realities, perhaps along with the multiverse of alternative realities, simulated and otherwise. The central thesis of the book is virtual reality is genuine reality. This applies both to full-scale simulated universes such as the Matrix and to the more realistic virtual worlds of the coming metaverse. Arguably, therefore, one can envision how the inner path of Shabid Yoga meditation, along with the development of satsang centers, will digitally evolve by utilizing the very best that AI, VR, AR, and MR has to offer. It is not that the core of meditation itself will change. Bhakti, one-pointed attention, and listening to the inner sound are inviolate, but that spiritual guidance and practices can be contextualized and augmented in ways unimaginable just decades prior. Given the exponential growth of artificial intelligence, it is not hyperbolic to imagine a time when meditators will be provided with all the help necessary to make their inner voyages a reality plus. Thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this film on the topic of the future of artificial intelligence and meditation. And if you wanna learn more about it, we have created a book specifically for this conference and it's available for free as a PDF. Thank you.